Okay, hi everyone, welcome to this week's DDU teaching, which is about prosthetic valves in the critical care setting. Um, aside on it, I have to tell you all that this is an absolutely huge topic for one hour. Um, this is very much not even going to scratch the surface, I don't think, this this hour, but um, we, I think we should do more sessions. Uh, I think we almost need a separate session for mitral, aortic, you know, and then sort of transcatheter things as well. But I would really re recommend you all take a look at some of the, the guidelines. Um, you know, the one from Zogby, I guess, is a bit of a seminal paper from 2009. Um, and then there's sort of newer ones from, when's this one? I think like 2019 or something. And then we've got the new sort of transcatheter guidelines for tabbies and things, um, combination of American and, and European ones. So definitely check those out for some sort of baseline uh, knowledge. And um, I think why prosthetic valves are important to us and why I think it is important that it is part of the DDU um, syllabus is that we are seeing inc an increasing number of patients in the ICU with prosthetic valves and I, we're increasingly seeing you know elderly patients, they're complex etc so we do need to be able to obviously detect pathology and, and detect it early and there's more complex valve procedures now with sort of valve in valve and all the transcatheter things that are coming through so we definitely need to be aware of them and as we all know when these patients get sick whether it's a primary problem with the valve um, it can be a real time critical diagnosis. Um, so being able to recognise, you know, severe pathologies with with valve dysfunction is, I think, is 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 important. Um, and similarly, any patient that comes with sepsis that that has a valve in, so sort of um, any alteration in their fluid volume status and hemodynamic state can can of course impact our echo evaluation of valve function as well. So there's definitely lots of things to be aware of and to be afraid of. I think prosthetic valves are the one thing, you know, I don't think we can have any hubris around it and always asking for help, I think, is the key thing. Um, you know, it takes years and years of experience and even then, you know, people are still uncertain and they can be quite complex and challenging. So um, I think the key thing will be always to ask for, for help, really, if you've got someone with a, a, a valve, um, prosthetic valve, and you think there's something wrong with it. So the different types of prosthetic valves, um, this might be new to you, some of you. So we have mechanical valves and they tend to be bi-leaflet, single leaflet tilt, tilt discs, which are the ones in the middle here. And then the cage ball star Edwards, which is, I've not seen one and I think they're rarely implanted these days, but I think sort of in this, I think 1954, wasn't it, was the first valve replacement and um, Certainly in the 60s and things like that, these were being used, but certainly less less now as this cage ball system. I think predominantly I we tend to see by leaflets, not not infrequently, uh, both in the outpatient setting and in in the ICU. And then we have uh, bi prosthetic valves. So we have the stented bi prosthetic valves. Um, and I must say, there's different there's different obviously brands of all these of all these different valves as well. So we have the um, different you know, whether it's porcine or, or pericardial xenograft, uh, different ones here. And then, of course, we have the, the stentless valves as well. So usually, again, porcine or pericardial, and we don't have the, you'll see that the struts are quite prominent on stented valves, and they stand proud sort of in the LVOT or in the uh, mitral position. And obviously, we don't see that when we have stentless valves. And then we have the percutaneous valves, which are the two main types of TAVI tend to be the self-expandable TAVIs, which is this one here, H. Uh, they're the core valves. And then we have the ones that expand over a balloon, which are the Edward Sapien valves. I think it's obviously you need to be aware of the, the different different types, um, wh which ones patients have in, you know, really depends on a number of factors. and. Um, you know, usually it's obvious to be able to tell between the mechanical and biologic, but some of the, you know, obviously the nuance between different brands and effective orifice areas and, and what their expected gradients and things are is quite tricky. Um, so biological biprosthetic valves, they tend to last about 10 years and you, you don't necessarily need anticoagulation with them. Obviously, they don't have a, a closing and opening click. Mechanical valves last a lot longer. You obviously need lifelong anticoagulation. And this is a, a nice summary of the guidelines from the Americans and the Europeans. 
And as you can see, younger patients, they do tend to put aortic valve, um, mechanical valves in both aortic and mitral in, in patients less than 65 generally. Um, and those over 65 tend to have more bioprosthetics, but there's going to be overlap there. There's going to be nuanced individual patient factors that change that. So a useful app to use, which I use all the time whenever I'm reporting, um, you know, echoes for prosthetic valves, particularly the outpatient setting, is the BSE app. Have you guys got this? It's pretty cool, actually. So you can basically put in, you know, whatever valve you have, whether it's a <clears throat> St. Jude by Leaflet or Star Edwards by whatever it is, and then you can choose the size um, and it gives you what the effective orifice area is of that valve and what the expected be mean gradient is, which is really, you know, it's I mean, it's so useful when you're reporting them, especially if you've got that footprint echo to compare with as well. So I'd recommend using that. It's free. So this is how they look on echo. So we have the, the bi-leaflet valve at the top here. You can see the ring down sort of comet tails that you see coming off the two occluders. You have the hinge points um, and obviously the, the rigid sort of sewing ring. And we'll talk through, I'll talk through a little bit about the, the closing volume um, that you expect to see. The tilting disc, as you can see, it's a single tilting disc. And you tend to get, um, as opposed to the three sort of jets associated with bileaflet, which are physiological, you tend to just get this central central jet. And then the Star Edwards um, ball cage valve, you tend not to see much of a closing volume with those ones. And you can just sometimes see like this little puff of smoke appear in the LA. As I say, I haven't seen them in real life, but just at videos that I've uh, looked at um, on the ASC website and things. So this is a normal, this is how a, this is a, a toe image um, of a normal bileaflet valve. You can see that the occluders so you've got the occluders here. Um, they tend to open at an angle between 75 and 90. Um, they're opening symmetrically and closing symmetrically. You've got those lovely sort of comet tails coming down, which obviously um, obscures things in the left ventricle, but it, it's a nice to see that because you know that the both occluders are opening nicely. And we have three washing jets, one that comes centrally and the other that the others that come um, either side. Um, of the orifices there, so you have these three orifices. So this is what the this is what the washing jets will look like. So it's important to recognise that that's normal. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the the reason the reason that they're there and these sort of that closing volume is in theory to prevent thrombosis. So you've always got some movement of blood over there, and. You know, the key things about them is how you know it's not pathological. Firstly, they're coming through the where you expect them to. They're not coming paravalvular. Um, they're quite narrow at the base and they're actually quite homogenous and, and not too, um, there's not too much sort of uh, flow turbulence, um, which all sort of are in keeping with a, a normal washing jet and a physiological. Um, so what's the closing measure. volume? So it's between like five and seven mils. When the when the valve closes, there's a certain volume of blood that sort of sticks on them. And oh. then as it opens and closes, that that five mils or whatever that's around the valve yeah. will wash through as, as washing jets. Oh, so okay. there's always a little bit of residual volume associated with prosthetic valves. Sure. So, so that looks like... Uh... Where are you going though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yes, exactly. Oh, so okay. so that, that's what that's what's giving you your your washing jets. Sure. Oh, okay, that's what the valve closed. It's having those jets. Oh okay. yeah. 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 They sort of come through it yeah, as they're yeah. opening and closing. Um so physiological regurg essentially. Sure. Um this is a tilting, a tilting disc, so a single leaflet tilting disc. Um you can see how that opens quite differently to the to the bi leaflet. Um and you've got all that sort of ring down comet tail just on the single leaflet. And then you have that single, single washing jet tends to be in the center. Uh, as I say, ball and cage, you see that sort of turbulence here. And then you tend not to see much of a, they've got a lower, a smaller closing volume because they're less thrombogenic and things. So they, they don't need to have as, as much when they're designed. And you tend to just see that sort of puff of virgin sort of smoke in the top mm -hmm. of yellow. So that's how that looks. I guess more commonly we we see biprosthetic stented. These are sort of like the bread and butter of what we see when we're reporting a lot. Um, and the most common would be sort of that bioprosthetic um, in the mitral position. 
Um, things to say, this is obviously the sewing ring, um, tends to be porcelain or, or pericardial, as we said. And you have these struts that sort of these, you know, it looks like a, um, a coronet, doesn't it? Where you have these sort of struts standing proud and you can see them here on either side. Nice pliable leaflets opening beautifully. Um, and, you know, this this looks physiological. So you have got some flow turbulence through that, but you haven't got a big, you know, piezo dome forming to suggest that there's obstruction through there. You can see the 2D where they're opening beautifully and there's some trivial um, valvular regurgitation, which is often fairly normal, especially after they're first implanted. So that's what that's what normal would look like. Um, does anyone know what this kind of valve would be? If you want to hazard a guess. Do you recognise like it? Looks like a stented bioprosthetic valve. Yeah, nice Rob. Absolutely. So that, that they're the struts that I was sort of saying that that stand proud in the LVO in the um, aorta there. You can see it here. Um, and you can see it nicely in, in short axis. So one, two, three of those struts. And then you've got obviously the the leaflets. Um, and this is an this is a normal functioning uh, bioprosthetic stented valve in the aortic position. So they use the same valve in the aortic as com you know compared to the mitral, which I just showed you there. That's the same valve, just in a different position. Yeah. Um, these are don't see many of these, but this is a stentless valve just taken from the guidelines. Um, you can see you haven't got the the struts sort of standing. Then, and all you can really tell some, it's often you can miss these easily, I think. Um, the only thing that you often see is just a bit of thickening around the actual um, aorta or wherever it's inserted. And then, of course, we have TAVI valves as well, so trans aortic um, valve implantations. Um, a lot more, we see a lot more of these. Um, they obviously look different to the stented bioprosthetic valves. You don't have the sort of three struts, but you have the sort of cage that you can sort of see in short axis. Um, you tend to see just sort of tram, bright tram lines um, where the TAVI is, and then obviously the, the leaflets. And sometimes with the TAVI, you do see this little gap as well. Um, in this particular patient, this gap is a little bigger, and there's actually uh, vegetations on the on the leaflets themselves. This is as ab abnormal TAVI, but um, I didn't have time to save save normal ones to show you. So this is one that I just quickly put on from a, a tour that we did a few months back. Um, so how do we assess valves with echo? Well, we use you know the standard standard techniques that we use for any uh, valve assessment, which is 2D and Doppler. Um, and we're going to look on 2D, we're going to look at the appearance and we'll talk through all of that. Um, and then we're going to look at effects of uh, dysfunction with remodeling as usual. So seeing the whole heart, um, you know, as we always say for any valve assessment and then color Doppler, um, pulse wave and continuous wave Doppler. And we'll talk through, um, we'll talk through some of these. So the, the, before we get on to that, the common, I guess, the complications that we see with valves in, in the ICU, you're either going to have a valve that's obstructed or that's, regurg you know, pathological regurgitation. You're going to see thrombotic or thromboembolic events related to them, endocarditis, prosthesis, dehiscence, which is, you know, infection and endocarditis until proven otherwise. Um, structural failure, whether that's from wear and tear, panis and panis ingrowth or calcification. Um, and I guess things like patient prosthesis mismatch are, you know, are definitely um, things that we need to to worry about as well. Um, and certainly something that you'd be calling your cardiology friend about um, if you're suspecting that. So it can be a little bit complicated. Um, so the thrombotic complications tends to be so thrombosis on valves tend to be more common in mechanical rather than bioprosthetic valves, and the mitral valve is mo most susceptible. Uh, risk factors would be things like the patient being in atrial fibrillation, having a big left atrium, obviously having a stasis with poor LV function. So all of the usual things that contribute, um, you know, that sort of Verkhoff's triad is exactly applicable um, in prosthetic valves. Um, and the main reason is you've you've lost that endothelialized, the protective endothelium that has all your natural, um, you know, fibrinolytic things in it. So you, you're just more susceptible to, to forming clots. 
So some of the masses, though, so whenever you see a mass on, on a valve, obviously the things you're going to think about mainly are going to be thrombus, vegetation, panis. They're going to be sort of the top three. Um, this one here is a, a thrombus, so an obstructive thrombus. And then we have panis ingrowth in this one here. Guys, can you see my arrow? No. Um, so panis ingrowth on this one, obstructive thrombus here. Um, lots of calcium and uh, rupture, actually, I think, in this one. Um, the, the, I think this, the, t the single leaflet uh, tilting dish just sort of ruptured out. So, but like odd things can happen, of course, with, with valves, but it tends to be thrombus or panis. And this is um, calcific sort of wear and tear. Um, tends to happen, you know, lit after, five, five, after five years and in papers that have looked at it. And then there's, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's more complex um, things happening now. Um, and I've certainly seen a few of these sort of valve in valve procedures as well. So patients that have had aortic valves that then have a TAVI in that, um, the bioprosthetic valves that have TAVIs or TAVI and, you know, TAVI and TAVI. Um, and I'll show you a case of one of one of those at the end, which is um, a TAVI in a mitral valve prosthesis for an obstructed uh, mitral valve. So the, um, you'll see some, you know, sort of different cases. Um, when we talk about thrombus versus panis, there's no real gold standard for knowing exactly what you're dealing with. And as everything, it's all about the clinical context, right? But um, the appearances, like whether they're off their anticoagulation, how old that valve is. Um, so, you know, if someone's been off their anticoagulation, they've got a subtherapeutic INR, the valve's less than five years old, you're going to be thinking more thrombus. And then the appearance can sometimes give it away, but not entirely. And of course, the two can coexist. So you can have thrombus and panis at the same time. But thrombus tends to be, um, you know, thickened. It tends to be um, less bright, sort of, it's more like a soft, a softer echogenic structure as compared to panis, where it tends to be, um, you know, generally on the edges, um, but still can be sort of on top of the valve. And it tends to be brighter and more echogenic. And I think we'll show some pictures of that. So Panis is more common in the aortic valve. Um, thrombus is more common in the mitral valve. This would be an aort. This is the aortic valve here. You can see all this bright sort of around the edges, this sort of panis in growth. Um, and that's when it was explanted. That's what panis looks like. Um, and as I said, it tends to be in older valves. And then thrombus, you know, sometimes this is really tricky, hey, but um, softer echo densities on the on the leaflet tips and but it can be anywhere across the valve um, and this is just showing a thrombus in the mitral in a, uh, a mechanical mitral valve um, showing an obstructed um, valve with a high mean gradient um, and before and after thrombolysis and I've actually got a real life case of, of one that we had as well um, with that. So, just going to minimize. How do I minimize this? It's really annoying, isn't it? It gets in the way. This mm, little thing down good. here. It won't let me drag. See? Yeah. That's the right. We'll work through. So, patient prosthetic mismatch. Um, I think you won't get you won't get shown this in your DDU exam. But for those studying for the American exam, you'll definitely get asked about it. It's when the site, obviously the it's there from when the, the valve goes in and um, hopefully you'll not have it, you know, because they'll put the right size in. But sometimes that's not always the case and they have it as soon as the valve goes in, essentially, because the valve size itself. So the effective orifice area is not able to meet the cardiac output demands of the body. Um, and that's because you've just put in too small a valve. Um, it ranges from about two to 10 percent, actually, in both aortic and mitral valves. Um, and of course, it's important to us in the ICU because if you've got someone coming in, you know, with a, a septic cardiomyopathy or whatever, or they come in septic and they've got a mitral um, patient prosthetic mismatch, that's going to increase for me hypertension, congestion, RV dysfunction, hypoxia, all of that. Um, so, that, so it can be unmasked, I guess is what I'm saying, through the stress test of, of the ICU. Um, so important to, for that, to be aware of that as a cause for high gradients. So, of course, with ECHO, we're going to do that multimodal assessment, um, 2D, 3D, um, colour Doppler, and we'll go through all of these, and then spectral Doppler. Um, and there's lots of different components to that. And I often, well, I, I think about assessing pros, 
aesthetic valves, a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. So you're not just taking one thing, you're taking the clinical context and then you're putting all the pieces together. And sometimes they they don't match their um, you know, they're incongruous and you've got to try and explain those um, discrepancies as well. Because sometimes, you know, one, the 2D might look completely different to what you're getting with your spectral Doppler. Um, and that can be for a number, a number of causes. So important to take it all in totality. And as I say, it's a bit like um, putting a jigsaw puzzle together. So these are 10 rules that I made up for the ECHO report um, when you're, you know, reporting prosthetic valves. So as we mentioned at the beginning, the type of valve and then the size of the prosthesis, really important if you can get that information, it helps you out a lot. Um, and of course, comparing that to their baseline study. Um, we need to report all the pertinent 2D and Doppler findings, not just, you know, go straight to Doppler and, and forget about reporting that. You've got to, of course, interrogate from all windows. And as I said, you've got to explain those discrepancies that you might see. In the ICU setting especially, we can't be reassured by a normal gradient because, um, as you can imagine, low cardiac output states, um, you know, you might have a normal gradient, but a, but a pathologically stenosed valve. So so don't just, um, you know, rest your hat on, on a gradient. Compare with baseline, that's really key. And I think, you know, it's really important that we recognise the limitations of transthoracic, especially in mechanical mitral prostheses but all prostheses really and we need to have a low th and they're complementary to each other and we'll talk through the different dropouts that you get with transthoracic versus toe um, and really they're complementary but really low threshold to perform toe in anyone with a prosthetic valve and you know being able to differentiate normal from abnormal with prosthetic valves it, it really takes skill and experience I definitely don't I'm not an expert in prosthetic valves I'm always asking for help with them um well you know for ones that are not straightforward and there's really no place as I said for hubris in the assessment of prosthetic valves because they'll bite you in the butt and um yeah as always combine it with the clinical history so let's look at some 2D assessment then so what we do is you want to look at the motion of the occluders and the leaflets, you know, occluders if it's mechanical, leaflet, leaflets if it's bioprosthetic. So, um, hey, Juan, what, what do you think of this? Um, what type of valve do you think this is? And can you spot any abnormality with that? I think it's a mechanical valve. So all the, the ring down artifact. Lovely. Yeah, very nice. Um, abnormality wise, I think it's like a, is it like a, I think it's a bi-leaflet mechanical valve and one yeah, of them nice. doesn't seem to be moving. Perfect. Love it. Yeah, exactly right. So this is a toe of a patient from a couple of weeks ago, I think, um, who had had anyway, had, had like lots of hemorrhagic complications and they couldn't be on their anticoagulation for whatever reason. I think she was in our ICU for a little bit. And this is exactly as Hoan was saying, this is a bi-leaflet mechanical valve. And um, you can see the ring down and you can see that this occluder is not moving at all. It's completely stuck, isn't it? Yep, it's completely stuck. So it's important to look at that, um, the movement, the symmetry, um, and whether you can see the, the usual artifacts as well can be helpful. And then, of course, you're going to look for any um, any echo densities or masses that you can see um, on the valve as well. And I really wish I could move this out of the way because I cannot see. One. Just makes it big, I think. Oh, sorry. And then, then you can sort of screen again. Hey. Just you might see your normal screen. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Um, oh. <laughs> I'll just drag that out of there. Sorry, guys. Um, no, it is what it is. Sorry, on our end, we can't see this part of the screen where you guys are, but that's okay. Um, Rishi, might you want to comment on what we can see on uh, this bottom? bottom right here yeah this is a um, um this is a toe image um a long axis view the aortic valve and the mitral valve in picture i think it stopped playing now i can see a mitral valve which is prolapsing but there's a uh, bioprosthetic uh, uh, valve in the aortic elevation uh, with mobile leaflets i can't see any mobility or rocking motion or adhesence at the the strut area in the aortic region. Um, coming to mitral, as I said, um, the posterior mitral leaflet is prolapsing, um, but the anterior mitral leaflet, um, I think it appears a bit sclerotic. Um, it's not that mobile, I can stop playing now. 
Yeah, oh. sorry, Rishi. I am just trying to um, to get rid of this because it's actually really quite annoying. Um, sometimes is there's something on this there, guys, where it says like minimize toggle or something like that for the. Tile to the left. But even my main man, Itard can't fix my technical problem. See what's happening? All right. Well, never mind. Anyway, Rishi, this is um, nice. This is a so bioprosthetic mitral, a stented bioprosthetic mitral, stented bioprosthetic aortic. Um, there isn't rocking of the mitral, I agree, but there's a huge whopping mobile, highly mobile mm. echo density with irregular um, shaggy edges. You see that right. um, on the on the mitral valve and then on the aortic, there's also mobile echo densities that I might just try and sneak around this thing that I can hardly yeah. see. But they're, they're here, they're yeah, thickened. And mobile and then there's also thickening here of the aortic root or the aortic mitral curtain and that's an aortic mm. root abscess actually Rishi that's happened there um yes. this patient ended up dying actually with us but um this was a, a, a post cardiac arrest uh, toll um so so important to look for any you know masses mm. and and also not just the masses but complications you know, related to ma to masses. So if that's infective endocarditis, really important to look for fistula, um, aortic root abscesses, um, you know, gabaldi, acquired gabaldi. Basically anything can happen, can't it, around a, a site of, in of infection. Um, but yeah, don't forget to look for the associated complications with that. And dehiscence of that valve is, is endocarditis until proven otherwise. And usually dehissed valves will, will have that rocking motion. I'll show you some pictures of some. Um, and then the integrity of the sewing ring and that, that sort of annular interface, um, you know, is have you got a big gaping 2D hole uh, with big paravalvular leak around that? So there's so there's lots of uh, components to to look at on 2D um, and it's important to, to do that in multiple views. So this is what I was meaning about um, about that, uh, you know, rocking. And stability. So this is a, a, a mechanical mitral valve that is completely dehissed. Can you see this um, this part here? This part here is completely dehissed. You've got a huge two okay. D defect. Yeah, probably because of this big vegetation around it, um, and it's rocking, and you get that huge uh, paravalvular uh, regurgitation through that. Um, this one here is a that one was taken, I think, from Stephen Huang's lecture. But this is a, a patient with a, a bioprosthetic stented valve um, that also had endocarditis. Um, and you can see this sort of um, gap opening up almost like a, a pseudo sort of aneurysm, um, an early aortic root abscess is what this patient ended up having um, with paravalvular leak around that stented uh, bioprosthetic valve. So you can just see these strands um, on the leaflet leaflet tips there, um, which are in this clinical context, there were uh, vegetations and there was dehiscence of that valve as well. Leaflet mobility. Um, so this is a, a toe picture of a um, of a um, mitral, mechanical mitral valve and the occluders are completely stuck. You see how it's not moving at all? Mm. And you're just getting turbulent inflow in and you're getting all those, you know, washing jets. You can imagine they're just stuck in position. Oh, in sort of a semi-open position and then all the, the rigor just coming coming back through and then look it's a talk in and of itself isn't it we've got 25 minutes left and i haven't even got to where i want to be but tap um and i think we'll talk about them another time but there's certain things to look at with um tavi valves as well and i'm just i'm gonna skip because we're massively running out of time um 3d assessment is really key you know for looking at prosthetic valves as well um gives you so much more information and obviously tor 3d is going to be um super helpful in with especially with things like paravalvular leak um you can tell you the size and and where it's coming from and and all of that this is a normal uh 3d of a, a bi leaflet um by bi, bi leaflet mechanical valve from the you know the la view on the left and then from the underside and the lv view on the right um 
This is a patient with a bioprosthetic mitral valve, uh, again, looking down from the LA on the left. And this is a valve that has lots of panis um, and calcification. And you've got restricted opening and obstruction uh, through that. Um, as you can see there, and that's what it looked like when it was explanted with all that awful panis and calcification around it. Um, and this is what a, a dehiscence would look like um, on 3D, which uh, I've seen a couple of times. Uh, this is taken just from a, a JACE article, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty awful for the for the patient. So after 2D and 3D, we move on to colour. So this is a you know, normal bioprosthetic valve with colour coming through. And this is what it might look like if we have a leaflet that's blocked by thrombus. You see increased turbulent flow, this sort of asymmetry there. Um, and of course, we always look for whether we can see that PISA or that flow convergence, if there's significant obstruction coming through the valve as well. Um, and we're going to look for valvular and paravalvular leaks. A really key thing to be mindful of is your blind spots. What do I mean by this? It's the area in the left atrium that you cannot see because that mitral prosthesis is completely blocking it. So with TTE, your blind spots are much more significant for mitral valves. And I think this is shown nicely in this, um, you know, this this picture is um, you can see here you could have a huge eccentric MR jet, but you're going to be blocked through your prosthesis and both in your parasternal and your apical positions here. So it's going to be completely blocked. Less of a problem um, for regurge with TTE with your aortic prosthesis, as you can see, because the blind spot in the apical three is down here. So you could still be able to see regurge with that. Um, and similarly, in your parasternal, you'll still still see regurge. But um, I guess the take home is that, you know, for any prosthetic valve, if you're worried about it, they need to have um, a toe as well. Um, and of course, there are going to be dropout spots on toe too, um, especially in the anterior, um, posterior portion um, with the aortic valve. And I'll show you some of this. So you can see here you get, you know, drop out from the sewing ring. Uh, so toe's not not perfect either. And you're going to have, um, you know, trade offs between toe and TTE for that. And if, has any of you heard of um, pseudo MR that you can sometimes get with mechanical mitral valves? It's a nice article. It was first described, I think. Well, it wasn't first described, but it was talked about sort of in an article um, back in like early 2000s um, by Rudsky. I think I can't actually see the little thing that I've got down there. But essentially what happens is when you've got a, a metallic mitral valve, then you get um, like some mirror image artifact and your LV flow that's coming through here just reflects off the prosthetic mitral valve and it gives you this appearance of pseudo mitral regurgitation when there isn't any. So it can look a little bit like this. And if you didn't know any better, you might think that that valve had terrible mitral regurg, but it's actually just mirror artifacts or pseudo MR from the mm. from the mechanical valve. So important to be aware of artifacts with prosthetic valves as well, which is why they can just be so tricky sometimes. And the thing that you can do to try and differentiate that is to put um, pulse wave Doppler through the MR or what you think is the MR, yeah. and it will look like your LV or T flow. Uh, so this is why we absolutely need to do a toll um, in patients where we're concerned about that prosthesis. Um, These are just stills, but we can see we have a me um, mechanical mitral valve here. Um, and we can't see very much apart from all the ring down in the left atrium. And we can see this little tiny bit of, of regurge down here. But in fact, when we toll this patient, there's a huge 2D gap. Um, dehiscence of that of that valve, which you cannot appreciate at all on TTE, and severe uh, mitral regurge. So if I haven't hammered this home enough, um, you know we need to be doing both. They're complementary. So this is it showing it in real time, and this is from the the nice Jace paper on it. So this is the valve here. We can't. All you can see is it looks a bit abnormal. Maybe there's like a little bit of rocking that you can see. There's lots of comet tail artifact ring down. Maybe you can see a little bit of regurge here. There's a you know turbulent flow going through, and then it's not until you do the the transesophageal that you see the, the real pathology. Um, so we talked a bit about the uh, normal washing jets. So as I mentioned, these are your three sort of normal washing jets, and you can see washing jets here and here. But these ones either side are not physiological. They're your paravalvular pathological regurge jets. Um, 
so 2D, 3D, colour, spectral Doppler, that usual um, sequence, right? So we're, with spectral Doppler, we're going to be looking at what it, you know, the shape, the contour of the spectral Doppler trace, what the velocity is, what the mean gradients are. We're going to work out our effective orifice area and index that, and then we're going to use the DVI, Doppler velocity index is just, I don't know, convention, what prosthetic valves tend to be called. It's the same as DSI, so a dimensionless serotonin index. Um, so let's go on to some of the numbers then for mitral valves, so normal. So when we put continuous wave through that mitral inflow through that prosthetic valve, we generally want the peak velocities to be less than 1.9, mean gradients less than 5. I'm going to talk you through this DVI here, which is less than 2.2. Essentially, the mitral valve VTI over your LVOT VTI, that should be less than 2.2. The orifice area should be more than 2 centimetres and the pressure half time is less than 130. So that's normal. Pathological stenosis this is going to this is going to test me now, isn't it? Because I can't actually see, see what that is. But um, pathological stenosis. So velocity of more than two and a half, uh, mean gradients of more than 10, and TVI values, TVI, DVI. I'm going to use that interchangeably. It's the same thing. Um, depending on what paper you read, whether it's the, the Zogby paper or the um, Blauet sort of paper where it's called TVI. It's, it's it's the same thing. It's the same ratio, more than two and a half. Um, valve area of less, effective orifice area of less than one centimeter, and your pressure half time getting up above two hundred. Mm -hmm. That that would be all in keeping with a pathological stenosis. Um, can you guys see that? All right. Yeah. And then we have possible stenosis in the middle, right? So between those values. Um, and, you know, these these values, these numbers are not hard and fast. Um, they, as I mentioned, they can often be um, discrepancy. So you might have high velocities, but like a low um, and, and sort of a high EOA, things like that. Like it's, you know, sometimes they don't all match, um, particularly with, with gradients and flow status changes in the ICU setting. So never hang your hat on one thing, but you do need to have, and you can just look these up, right? You're not going to necessarily commit all of these to memory all the time, um, but generally having a feel for what they are is, is obviously important. So mitral inflow, we're going to put continuous wave through that. And the things we're going to look at is the, we're going to look at the gradient, um, so in this one, it comes out with five, the peak velocity, you know, 1.9, and then we're going to measure pressure half time. The other thing we can tell from looking at this, um, and this is all normal, right, is the clo opening and closing clicks of the valve as well, which can often give you a little clue as to, to what's happening with the valve, you know, if you've lost them. So this is what a normal and an obstructed uh, trace would look like. So we've got a normal peak velocity of 1.1, we've got a mean gradient of 4 here, and a nice uh, short pressure half time. Okay, so that's very normal, um, as opposed to the obstructed one there where you can see the, see the numbers. But why can't we rely only on these mean, these mean gradients, particularly in the ICU setting, to tell us that that valve's obstructed? Low flow state might be falsely low, you know. Totally. Absolutely right. And that's probably the main thing. Hey, So if you've got someone with a low cardiac output state, they might absolutely have a pathologically obstructed valve with a gradient of five, with a mean gradient of five. So never be never be um, reassured by a normal gradient. If everything else is fitting with it being obstructed, um, then you need to go hunting for that. And of course, a gradient, a high gradient, high velocity, it tells us there's a problem with the valve, but it doesn't tell us what the problem is. And we need more information. So the causes of a high mean gradient, and you can you can do this for this sort of template for um, aortic and mitral, any valve really. Um, you either it's either going to be that you have got a pathological stenosis from thrombus, panis, endocarditis with an obstructing veggie, or functional stenosis. And we see this, I think, a fair bit in the ICU where you have these high flow states, early sepsis, hyperdynamic circulations, and that gives you a high mean gradient, but you're not truly pathologically obstructed. You've just got a high flow state um, and patient prosthetic mismatch right, would all fall under this. And then and then you can have a high mean gradient, of course, because you've got pathological regurg across that prosthesis increasing your gradient, which can be prosthetic or periprosthetic, so valvular or, or perivalvular. Um, 
guys, these, uh, the paper by Laurie Blowett is a lovely paper on um, prosthetic valves as well. This is it here at the top, actually. Um, and this is a night, this, I use this in my everyday practice. As I say, I don't, it's not um, foolproof, um, but it, it really is quite helpful for trying to figure out what's wrong um, with the valve. So the first thing uh, to start with is the pressure half time. So if that's more than 130 milliseconds and you've got a high gradient, and you've got a high gradient, that's pathological obstruction until proven otherwise. Okay, so that's, I quite like that, just as like, it's quite easy to remember. Um, and as I say, you can have a low gradient and still have pathological obstruction, but with a low flow state. Then if you've got a, pr a pressure half time, that's less than 130 milliseconds, and you've got a TVI, so that mitral valve VTI over your LV or TVTI, that's more than 2.2. That's pathological regurgitation until proven otherwise. So I, there's quite nice sort of rules to, to stick to for those things. And then it becomes more complicated, I think, in this sort of setting. Um, and you certainly need to have a, you know, a few pairs of eyes on, on these kind of valves. So your pressure half time is less than 130. Your TVI or DVI ratio is less than 2.2. This is the importance of calculating the... The orifice, the effective orifice area where you can be indexed, it should probably be indexed um, because you need to do that, especially if you're thinking about patient prosthetic mismatch. So if you've got patients, you know, with a normal pressure half time, a normal TVI, but they've got a high gradient and they've got a low indexed um, valve area, that's probably going to be patient prosthetic mismatch. Um, but if their valve area is normal and they've still got a high gradient, that's probably going to be a high flow state. And I think we see this a fair bit in the ICU, this sort of group here. Um, and, you know, this is sort of the normal group. So I really like this as a schema. As I say, it's not perfect, but it's quite nice. So this DVI or TVI, whatever you want to call it, is is what it says on the tin read. So it's continuous wave through the mitral valve and you measure the, the VTI and you divide that by your LV or TVTI. Um, it's a dimensionless number and with obstruction, stenosis or pathological regurge, depending on what the pressure half time is doing and what other things are looking like with the valve, um, this can be elevated. Um, and this is the opposite, right, to aortic valve DVI, where it's a lower value that signifies obstruction. And that's because you've got your LVOT VTI on top in your oh. aortic valve VTI on the bottom. Yeah. So for the mitral prosthesis, for whatever reason, convention, they've just flipped the DVI around so that your LV or TVTI is on the bottom. It's important to be aware of that. <laughs> I know it's a bit confusing. Um, so this is interesting, right? This is a patient who has a high, so more than 1.9, so it's a uh, continuous wave through the mitral valve. They have a high mean gradient of a five. The LVOT VTI is 16 and their mitral valve VTI is 42. So we've got high velocity, high gradient problem. What's going on, right? So we work out the T, the VTI, and it's 2.6, so above that magic number of 2.2 or, or 2.5. The pressure half time, they haven't shown you here, but it is less than 130. Less than 130. Yeah. What might it be? High for this thing. Yeah, this would be like that pathological regurge state, hey, where you've got um, a high TBI. And this is actually the Doppler from this patient with the um, with the big paravalvular leak. Yeah. Um, so the effective orifice area is the stroke. You work that out through doing stroke volume. So as, as you would normally do stroke volume through your LVOT, so cross-sectional area of your LVOT times VTI over the VTI of your mitral valve prosthesis. So standard continuity equation, nothing fancy, um, and less than 1.2 is abnormal, indexed. Um, important that you can't use the pressure half time to calculate valve area as you can for a native mitral valve. So that's completely out of the window for a prosthetic mitral valve, and you must use this continuity equation. Um, yeah, I mean, there's caveats there. I'm going to skip through for time. Of course, you've got to look at what then the blockage, the prosthetic, you know, the, the, that's doing to the rest of the heart. Have they got pulmonary hypertension? Have they got RV dysfunction? Um, you know, for aortic valves in particular, what the LV, LA remodeling is, things like that. Um, and then, of course, there's not just obstruction, there's prosthetic mitral regurgitation. And it tends to be a similar um, approach to when you're doing native valve um, uh, mitral regurgitation. As you can see from these guidelines, they're pretty 
they're pretty similar to um, native mitral valves, but it's a lot more tricky, is what I would say. Um, but we're going to be using all the similar things. So a nice sort of um, simple thing for thinking about whether there's significant pathological regurg. You've got high velocities, high gradients, so there's a problem. You've got a short pressure half time, you've got an increased VTI, TVI, more than 2.2. Then think about pathological regurg, basically. It's quite a nice thing. And then just quickly, the numbers for um, prosthetic aortic valve. Normal would be a velocity, a peak velocity less than three, mean gradients less than 20. Remember, guys, these are not hard and fast. And you remember that app I showed you at the beginning? Every valve is going to be slightly different. So you need to know the footprint for that patient. Um, but this is this is what's in the guidelines as a general rule. And just to confuse everyone, I've gone back to D DSI here, but I think it's actually DVI in the guidelines. Doesn't matter, it's the same thing. Um, of more than 0.3. Remember this time it's LVOT VTI of aortic bowel VTI. Um, effective orifice area more than 1.2. Um, Axel time less than 80, so that nice sort of triangular shape. And the acceleration times, so the time from onset of ejection to peak ejection is short because there's no obstruction through that valve. As opposed to a pathologically stenosed aortic valve, where you've got high gradients, high velocities, your DSI, your DVI is less than 0.25, same number as in um, native aortic stenosis. Um, effective orifice area of less than 0.8. This time you've got a prolonged acceleration time because it's taken a while for all that the highest velocity to get there. So you've got this sort of parabolic rounded shape, right? Because you've got that stenosis through that through that valve. So I think that, that kind of makes sense. I quite like the um, you know, the XL time and contour stuff. This is a nice schema that's in the guidelines for prosthetic aortic valves. So as usual, at the top we have the You've got high velocities, high gradients. So that's is there is a problem. I need to figure out what that problem is, or there's a potential problem. I need to figure out what that is. And then we can look at the DVI. If that's less than 0.25 and you've got a rounded um, appearance of your spectral Doppler and your axel time is more than 100. Mm -hmm. And we can also look at the ratio of axel time to ejection time as well. Um, and these are pretty well validated, these numbers, then that is absolutely um, suggestive of pathological obstruction until pr proven otherwise. Um, however, if you go, if you've got a DVI less than 0.25, you've got elevated gradients, but you've got this triangular jet, your axial times less than 100, you've just got to think, am I measuring things correctly? Have I got a falsely low DVI, essentially? because I'm not measuring my LVOT velocity correctly. Um, if your DVI is more than 0.3 and you've got a rounded appearance, this can happen um, you know, with a long acceleration time. It, it could happen because again, you are, um, you've got incorrect, incorrect measurements or you've got some subvalvular narrowing um, and you, you may absolutely well have um, stenosis of that valve as well. And generally, um, if you've got a triangular jet um, with an axial time of less than 100 and your DVI is sort of, you know, more than 0.25, um, you know, it's probably a normal valve. But you need to, again, work out the effective orifice area for that valve as well. Um, and if that's normal, it's going to be high flow state. And then if it's abnormal, you potentially have patient prosthesis mismatch. So just remind you, just go through all of that. It takes a bit of time to get your head around it, but it's 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 actually quite intuitive when you go through it properly. I'm going to skip this because I go through this all the time, but it's essentially the importance of Doppler angle and not underestimating your peak velocities and things like that. Um, interrogating from all windows, super important. This is how you would do your EOA for your um, your aortic valve. Um, you know, it's, again, it's the continuity equation, which we're all familiar with. Just remind yourselves in the guidelines where they tell you to do the, the measurements for your LVOT cross-sectional area, which is at the tip of the um, tip of the, the sewing ring of your valve to where it, where that meets with the ventricular septum septum and again the sewing ring of the valve where that meets the anterior base of the anterior mitral leaflet that's where you want to do your measurement and of course zoom in you know turn down your compress a little bit um and sort of you know make sure that's as accurate as it can be and all of the good things that we talk about all the time for bti of your um bti of your lvot and we've talked through that that's essentially the DVI for your aortic valve, so the opposite way around, less than 0.25 is the magic number. Um, we talk about this again in the 
when we talk about aortic stenosis, not being in that flow turbulence, you're going to overestimate your VTI and make erroneous um, conclusions. So be in the blue is what we sort of talk about. These, this is a nice paper if you've got chance to have chance to have a look at it, just um, essentially going through the Axel time um, and how accurate it is and its positive and negative predictive value and things like that. It's a, it's a pretty good uh, marker combined with um, the ratio of Axel time to ejection time. Um, so it's definitely something you should be measuring in all prosthetic aortic valves. Um, this shows a normal valve. Um, you can see there is nice opening and closing clicks. You've got a triangular shape. You've got a DVI of 0.4. You've got a nice short acceleration time that fits your eyeball, that it's triangular. And your mean gradients, you know, not too bad. It's 22. As opposed to an obstructed valve where we've got a velocity of five and a half. We have a mean gradient of 80. We have a DVI of 0.18. We've got a really long axle time, you know, this sort of parabolic shape through the aortic valve. Um, and you see we've lost those nice sort of uh, opening closing clicks as well. I'm not going to talk about pressure recovery. Essentially, you can overestimate um, the Doppler gradients using um, if especially if you've got small bileaflet valves, mechanical like St. Jude's bileaflet 19 millimeters, you could potentially be overcalling something because of this phenomenon of pressure recovery, which we can talk to another time. But um, I'm going to skip for time's sake, I want to show you some cases. Um, so regurg, again, guys, just read the read the guidelines. It talks you through how to, you know, try and quantify prosthetic aortic valve regurgitation. It's very much, very much similar to native valve aortic regurg. You'll be pleased to know the numbers are all pretty much the same. Um, important to look at the descending aorta for diastolic flow reversal, all of that. Those important readouts. Um, I guess for the TAVIs and things, we can also, we tend to look at the circumferential extent of the paravalvular regurg. Um, and this is a picture of that here. So if it's more than, if it's, you know, you have it on, on fast like that, you're looking in the short axis. And if your regurg takes up more than 30%, that's in keeping with severe paravalvular regurg. Less than 10%, like this one here, would be mild paravalvular regurg. So that's quite nice. But you do need to, you can't just look at this, of course, you need to look at, you know, everything that's in this um, table here. So this is mild, moderate and severe. So just um, in your own time, just have a look through those. Some examples here, mild um, valvular regurgitation, severe valvular regurgitation. I think these ones are going to play. This is showing some mild paravalvular regurgitation here. And then we have some moderate to severe um, paravalvular regurgitation there on the side. Uh, this is one of our cases of a bi stented bioprosthetic valve, um, which I'm just going to go through for now. So we just have, you can see the stir, this is a toe picture. You can see the three stent, uh, three struts. You can see mobile echo densities on the leaflets. You can appreciate it here in the upstream surface of the aortic valve. And you can see pretty nasty looking, getting towards sort of 30% circumferential um, paravalvular regurgitation and suggestion maybe, um, you know, of abscess formation there as well. And this is again showing what a severe paravalvular leak would look like. Um, let's play that again for you so you get to see. Essentially, the thing about prosthetic valves is just seeing lots of them. Um, so you can see taking up more than 30% of that circumference. This is also a stented, stented valve, but taking this is taken from one of the Jace papers. Um, and you can see that awful, severe uh, paravalvular regurgitation there. And you would try and do as many quantitative measures as possible, right, if you, if you could. Um, so vena contractor, um, both the, the diameter as well as the area and things like that. Um, and then, you know, volumetric quantitative techniques to try and work out the regurgitant fraction. Um, is there a flow convergence? You know, so bringing your baseline down and things like that. Um, you know, all the usual things that you would do for native valve AR, you should be doing for prosthetic valve AR. And never forget the descending aorta. It's just showing flow reversal there, which we're familiar with. So I might just show you a few cases then, guys, um, and do a little bit of quizzing, if that's all right. So, Michael. 
What do we think of this? Okay, so it's a... Some of them are normal, by the way. Okay, it's a trap. So there's a stented bioprosthetic mitral valve in this toe image. Um, it looks like the, the leaflets are moving nicely. Can't see anything wrong with that. Aortic valve maybe isn't very well visualized in this view, but I think it's native. Oh, it's probably a trap. Um, <laughs> and then the pressure gradients. I mean, the pressure gradients only two and a half and four. Yeah, yeah. With... And that's through your mitral, yeah. 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 Yep. That's normal. Yeah, it is normal. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So a stented bioprosthetic mitral valve, mean gradients are less than five. Mm. And so this is a normal, normal valve. Um, Five-year-old prosthetic heart valve, what type of valve and what's wrong with it? Hey, Juan. Um, I'm not familiar with the tone of you, but is that... um? This is zero degrees, you know, the mid-esophageal zero degrees that we did? Yeah. The other day. So this is That's your mitral. mitral. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there is uh, it's a. So first question, is it bioprosthetic or is it mechanical? It's bioprosthetic. Nice. Yeah. Um, and it's probably stented because most stented. of them are, but you can also appreciate oh, it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, on both on the visualized leaflets, there is mechogenic. Heterogeneous, like acrogenic mass. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm concerned about inflammatory endocarditis and yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, that'd be my putting all that together. So, yeah, mass, um, you know, endocarditis, vegetation, thrombus, pallets, but it looks more like a veggie, doesn't it? Yeah. So, craggy appearance, but yeah, clinical context. So, stented bioprosthetic mitral valve. Um, highly mobile, thickening endocarditis until proven otherwise. Um, this is still not uh, Rishi. Might you want to comment on the not on the mitral prosthesis, but on the aortic prosthesis? Yeah. So uh, I think this is also a uh, bioprosthetic aortic valve, uh, but it's distinct. It's like days and in the near the aortomitral curtain with rocking motion of the aortic valve and with possible some mass attached to the lower end um, could be a vegetation it has to be cross-checked in other views and same on the short axis view you can see the descents with blood flow around the strut of the aortic valve um, along with possible a um, yeah, there is dehiscence there, I can't say whether there is abscess or not. Yeah, very nice, Rishi. Exactly right. St stented aortic bioprosthesis, there's rocking of that valve. That's dehiscence and, you know, infective endocarditis until proven otherwise. There's severe regurgitation associated with that, which is um, mainly paravalvular regurgitation. Um, is there anyone else online or some people dropped off? Oh, Rob, you're still there. Cool. Hi, Andrew. Um, Rob, might you want to comment on this Doppler waveform? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so this is spectral Doppler through, it looks like it's through the mitral valve um, on a toe image. Um, and surrounded... Rob, just to, sorry, just to correct you before you go on, it is, um, it's a five chamber TTE actually. Sorry, it's not very clear. Oh. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. In which case, yeah, it's a rounded, uh, rounded shape. Um, I can see the acceleration time is prolonged, although I can't see if it's been quantified. Um, and if we were to do, it's got a high maximum velocity, uh, 4.8 meters per second. Uh, and if we were going to do the acceleration time to ejection time ratio, it looks like it would be approaching at least a third which would be getting towards that severe range. Very nice, Rob. So based on the, the maximal velocity, the mean gradient, the contour 
your eyeball of what the Excel time is, even though they're not giving you it. What what would you if someone showed you this and said this patient has a, you know, biprosthetic aortic valve, what would you be thinking just from a snap a snapshot look at this trace? It looks like severe um, biprosthetic aortic stenosis. Yeah, very nice, Rob. Lovely. So yeah, you can get so much information, hey, from from Doppler. Um, very nice. This is this patient absolutely had severe uh, stenosis. Um, patient reports some sort of uh, his some kind of valve replacement. What do you think, uh, Michael? Some kind. Uh... So it's a, it's, I'm going to start talking until I can work it out. <laughs> it's a toe image at metasophageal at 120 degrees, the anterior mitral valve leaf that looks thin and nice and it's moving well. There is some dropout from that sort of around that sort of, oh, I don't know, is that po the posterior mitral valve leaf that I can barely see it at all? Maybe yeah. it's been, maybe it's a posterior mitral valve leaf that repair. Mm -hmm. um, or yeah. it's something in the aorta yeah. that I can barely see. So, yeah. oh, right, he's had some sort of, he's actually had yeah. a, um, aortic surgery as well. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a, it's, you it's know, like a Dacron graft in his aorta along with a, probably a <laughs> tissue aortic valve. Yeah, nice. This is, um, you know, at the beginning, I mentioned that those dentless uh, oh. bioprostheses are really hard to spot sometimes. It's really all about the clinical history. And often all you can see is thickening um in the aorta and this is a stentless um stentless prosthesis um all right what are we seeing here um rob do you want to go again sure uh so, so is, they're not all abnormal yeah this is transesophageal image uh at 60 degrees um looking at the mitral valve um, and it looks like a mechanical bioleaflet mitral valve. I can see Beautiful. there's some washing jets um, and on 2D both of the leaflets are opening nicely. Uh, so it looks normal from this assessment. Very nice. Yep. Yep. Normal. Rishi? Yep. So this is a four chamber view transthoracic echo. Um, what looks like a mechanical uh, mitral valve, um, but looks like this minimal mitral, the leaflet opening. So I'll be concerned um, regarding a severe mitral stenosis. We'll be checking towards say, you know, yeah, so mechanical mitral valve, but looks like uh, some, um, there's a lot of shadowing into the literary atrium, but I can't make out the motion of the leaflets. The mass, which is mobile, um, which is attached, I would like to ch check in different views to see uh, what exactly that is, whether it's a vegetation or something, uh, a leaflet, uh, which is mobile. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> Agree with you, Rishi. And sometimes these single, this is a single tilting mechanical uh, disc mechanical valve. And sometimes because okay. we don't see that many of them, it, you know, it's hard to, as I was saying at the very beginning, you know, recognizing normal from abnormal is, is often step one. And that's even hard sometimes just because, you know, we're not cardiologists. We don't see these all the time. And um, so definitely asking your friend, interrogating this in all views, absolutely doing your Color Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, making sure this is all right. But this is actually a normal, ends up being a normal functioning single uh, leaflet, single leaflet valve. Um, a one. This is probably a bit mean because you haven't done as much toe, Michael. Okay. So what type of valve you think it is, and what could be happening? Okay, so it's a it's a toe, and it looks like it's just a metasophageal at zero degrees. There's a mitral valve replacement. It's I don't think it's oh actually it probably is mechanical because there's all this dropped out there. Yep. So it's a mechanical valve. There's a couple of washing jets and then there's a large paravalvular leak. Beautiful um, on the posterior side. Yeah. Can you all see that? So there's the washing jets here. Um so this is I think this is a bileaflet valve. Um 
I don't actually know what the answer is here. But I think it's by leaflet, but you're just seeing it at zero degrees, so you're not seeing the two leaflets. It's often not until you get to 60 that you see that lovely two leaflets in the top. Um, you've got the washing jets where the uh, where the struts are, and then you have, um, yeah, as Michael said, severe uh, paravalvular, paravalvular leak. Yeah, that's what it is. Good. Uh, I think I've already shown one like this. I don't know. This is not ours, actually. It was similar to one of, that we've had. Uh, Rishi, you want to go for it? Yeah, sure. So again, a, a mid-esophageal four-chamber view at zero degrees, uh, showing a bileaflet mechanical bioprosthetic uh, valve. And it's a 2D image. Um, right. Uh, make out much abnormality in that um, excepting maybe the tilting looks like it's unilateral i've not seen many to come in where it's normal or abnormal um and the color doppler there are washing jets that we're showing there but it's a larger jet posteriorly um which i'll be concerned about whether um there's a dehiscence there um with which I would like to interrogate a bit more uh, yeah, to see nice. whether that's more. Nice, Rishi. And I agree. It's hard when you haven't seen seen that many. But this is, um, again, this is more or less zero degrees, isn't it? They've just come to about mm -hmm. 18 um, in a toe. And you can see that um, you have asymmetrical movement of the occluders. Mm -hmm. So remember I said before about those nice symmetrical comet tails that come down and you see them moving and coming back together. So that's a nice tick some uh, trip. Um, trick sometimes where you can't see that comet tail moving at all it's just stuck you see that one so that occluder is yes. not moving at all so that's a completely fixed um fixed Listen. occluder there uh, which is a big problem which is either panis or thrombus or even infective endocarditis something is wrong with that valve um, and i suspect if we interrogate it there'll be obstruction and things through it um and i i can't actually see that bottom that bottom one plane because it's hiding, but there is some uh, valvular regurgitation associated with that. As you can imagine, right? You've just completely stuck, so you've got a big gaping hole. But this time, val yeah. valvular regurgitation rather than paravalvular. Um, Rob, do you want to comment on what you can see here? Sure. Um, this is a toe image again, it's at about probably forty-five to sixty degrees of the aortic valve, um, and there's been a probably a biomechanical stented valve placed there. Um, and I can see probably severe, approaching 30% of the uh, ring uh, paravalvular regurgitation. Nice, Rob. Yeah, so this is a, and often you, this is a, a mechanical, uh, probably by leaflet in the aortic valve, I think you can see a bit of the common tail coming down and you can't see the lovely, you know, struts or the uh, leaflets like you do for a bioprosthetic extended in the aortic. And there's, yeah, I mean, somewhere between moderate to severe hay and you'd need to obviously uh, go through all your things to see. Actually, I didn't write this. It's more than 30, which is severe, not 20. Um, yeah, more than 30. OK, this is one of our cases, um, which you've already commented on, actually. Rishi had commented on this at the beginning. Um, essentially, horrific infective endocarditis of both prosthetic leaflets, um, both, both prosthetic valves with a cavitation here. You see that? That's sort of pulsating and really thickened and nasty looking, really heterogeneous, um, thickened aortic root there. Do not miss an aortic root abscess, like terrible. Um, and this is what this ended up showing. And we can see it in short axis, um, uh, bioprosthetic stented valve, all this awful abscess material around it. And then when you put colour on that, you've actually got colour um, going up uh, into that abscess cavity as well. You see just a little colour coming through. You see that? Sorry, where are you? Uh, pointed out to you here. Colour coming into through. Into the abscess cavity, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, so valve is um, obviously falling apart and then they get all sorts of fistulas and, um, you know, terrible complications, complete heart block, things like that, uh, aortic root abscess and death. Um, so I do have some cases. I'm mindful I'm 15 minutes over. Um, so I'm very happy to show you these again. 
I might just go through them if that's all right, just for time. I don't want to keep you all on longer, but um, this is a chap that came to our unit. He was pretty sick in cardiogenic shock. He had he was actually awaiting a redo MVR. He's very non-compliant with his anticoagulation. Um, actually, I might just quiz Michael. Michael, what valve is this? It's a bit hard to tell. It's definitely a, a mitral valve replacement. I think it's probably mechanical because there's a lot of drop out at the back, but it might be a bioprosthetic valve as well. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So it's so you see the um the struts. Oh yeah. And they often stand oh, yeah. stand proud sure. in the LBOT. Yeah, yeah. 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 And they often can, you know, they can you can see how this could protrude, it oh. protrudes towards the left ventricular septum. And you can actually get LVOT okay. obstruction mm. in, um, after that. So, yeah, it's a bioprosthetic stented uh, mitral valve. You can't see much in the way of leaflet movement. Um, definitely need to look at that in more views. When we look at colour, we've got um, really turbulent inflow with a Pisa dome and a little bit of regurg. But remember what we said about those blind spots with regurg? Um, you absolutely might be missing horrific um, regurg here. So don't. Don't um don't be fooled by that on TTE because you might get not so much with that. Um, and this is just showing a similar thing. I do wonder whether this is um pseudo MR or not. I can't tell. I'd have to. I've, I've only got these loops to look at. Um, again, you know the upstream consequences of of this obstructed mitral valve, um, flattening of the intraventricular septum, pressure and volume loading of the RV um, as a result of the uh, mitral stenosis. Continuous wave Doppler through the um, mitral prosthesis. Rob, what are the key things to notice here? Some of the key numbers to point out. So the maximal velocity is high, so greater than 2.5. Yeah, um, very nice. And then the mean gradient is very high at 16. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I guess we could, we haven't, you can't you use this or I don't feel like you can use the pressure half time to estimate your valve area, but we could Beautiful. use the, we could use the VTI and um, do the ratio with the LVOT VTI to um, see if it was greater than 2.5. Um, yeah, very, a, wait, wait. very nice. Very nice, Rob. You can definitely use the the you know work out the DVI, um, and more than two point two or two point five for sort of severe obstruction. But remember, we can use the absolute value of the pressure half time, which is often really useful. Yep. So the the key thing is that you can't use pressure half time to work out valve area, but you can use it as an absolute value. And remember the the Larry uh, Larry Blowett um, sort of uh, what do you call it? um pathway or mm, what flow diagram. diagram thank you of um you know at the top where we start with that 130 is your pressure half time less than or more than 130 so more than 130 high mean gradient pathological obstruction flow chart flow <laughs> chart flow <laughs> chart oh my goodness it's terrible it's embarrassing um so yeah you can use uh, the absolute values well. it's not perfect rob it's affected by heart rate and all of that but um and again it's that jigsaw puzzle so that was lovely all the things that you recognize there um you know would be so you'd be concerned with the 2d with the color with the story and with this continuous wave doppler that this is pathologically obstructed this mitral valve and as you exactly said you would want to work out the other things so in this patient we worked out the tvi dvi and it was seven so crazy high and the uh, valve area we're using the continuity equation um, 0.4 so severely obstructed and he ended up having a toe and then went as he was expedited for his surgery. Um, this is the one that I've already shown you, actually. So this is the lady that came um, to our unit. She'd had a metallic by leaflet MVR, but she'd had hemorrhagic strokes when she was on warfarin. So she'd been on Clexane and she presented with uh, shortness of breath um, with her chest pain. And um, we can see this is zero degrees, so you you know you've, you can tell it's mechanically. You've got all these sort of ring down comet tails, a um, few little cavitation bubbles there. Which um, and then we've got the one of the washing jets next to the struts. But we also then when we go around to the sixty degrees, now we're seeing that completely stuck fixed uh, occluder, mm. um, and this lady's got a big thrombus um, sat on her 
you know, sat on her uh, prosthetic valve, which is causing that occluder to be to be fixed. And you can sort of see it on top of the occluder there. Um, you know, it'd be nice to have 3D and everything, wouldn't it? And just look at that. I know. Um, there's just some more pictures of it uh, completely stuck. And you can see not much in the word path pathological regurg, but we've got that really turbulent inflow. And you can see that little piezo dome sure. just forming on top as well. Yeah. Um, and she had a velocity of more than 2.2, so 2.3, and a mean gradient more than, you know, more than five, so 14. Um, and I'm sure all of her other numbers sort of fit in the, the profile itself, doesn't it? Just it, the pressure half time is going to be more than 130, so pathologically obstructed uh, valve. Um, this is a patient, Michael's private patient. So we had, my, Michael and I were on call um, a few months ago now, and this is a classic Sunday afternoon, right? No one, no one's really around in the hospital. Things are winding down. And we had a 65-year-old man who's non-English speaking come who was peri-arrest, um, came from ED with a working diagnosis of sepsis. We managed to get a quick history from his son and listen to his chest. And it sounded like he had a mechanical valve and he'd actually stopped taking his warfarin two weeks prior. Um, terrible images, no ECG leads connected, but really suspicious for, you know, he's also got a, um, a, a aortic valve in as well, a prosthetic aortic valve. But this mitral valve was really concerning. You can't really see the you know, the occluders very well at all. Um, there's quite a lot of ring down um, and sort of abnormal movements there. We've got turbulent inflow, maybe some regurg, but we can't see it all that well. Um, this guy was too sick to have a toe. He would have arrested uh, during the toe. Um, again, terrible four chamber. We've got this, um, you know, mechanical mitral valve here, which we cannot see at all and cannot make any comment on. Um, again, colour through. I mean, who knows? There's some turbulence through that. It looks abnormal. Maybe there's a little bit of, um, you know, we can see that really turbulent inflow with piezodome formation on it. He is tachycardic at the time, um, probably to about 120, something like that. But his uh, velocities are high, his mean gradient's 15. Um, his TVI is through the roof with a VTI through his mitral valve of 55 and he's so shocked and shut down his LVOT VTI is somewhere around 11, 12 and it was quite difficult to get that trace and of course he has a prosthetic um, uh, aortic valve in as well. He was in cold and wet cardiogenic shock with B lines throughout both of his um, upper zones and terribly hypoxic. So we we obviously had, you know, urgent sort of MDT discussions with cardiothoracic surgeons, cardiologists and, you know, what to do. I, you know, I felt we don't have ECMO backup or any emergency bypass um, in this hospital. And so the decision was and I thought if we told him we, he would, um, you know, he wouldn't tolerate that well and he probably would arrest during toll, which I didn't think would be good for him. So we actually decided to, you know, after consenting with his son to actually thrombolize him um, and, I, you know, I, within hours, um, he'd got he'd got better. He'd warmed up. His lactate had come down. Now um, he was off noradrenaline. Um, unfortunately, he did develop an embolic complication to his arm. He had to go to theatre and have had that um, have that clot removed. And but this is his toe image when he was much more stable. Uh, Twenty four hours after thrombolysis, you can see a normal functioning um, normal functioning bi leaflet uh, mechanical mitral valve. His aortic valve thankfully looked okay as well. Um, and this is the gradient through his mitral valve. His heart rate had settled down, but his gradient had gone from what, 16 to two and a half. Losses had improved, uh, increased, uh, reduced, and he clinically was better. And he actually went home on day four. So he went to the ward, I think, the day after, and then went home a couple of days after that. Uh, so not an easy case, and certainly not one you'd be sort of. Um, you know, it's it was a big decision to to thrombolize, but um, anyway, sometimes, and I think for me that case really highlights for me the benefit of doing you know advanced echo qualifications when you're an intensivist because that was a Sunday afternoon. You know, the cardiologist was quite far away. Um, there was no one else really that could have done that done that echo, and um, I think it was you know it was really useful to have that skill set. Um, and I've shown this case before, so I'll not go over it again. But it was a I'll show you some cool. This is the one I was talking about at the beginning with the uh, valve in valve. So it was a lazy with the end stage renal failure. 
I came in, you know, really shocked, short of breath, um, cardiogenic shock, and she has this stented bioprosthetic mitral valve that she'd had in for a number of years with extensive panis and absolute restriction of that posterior leaflet, um, not moving at all. So they actually put her on to, she was in her mid 80s, they put her on to ECMO and took her to the cath lab, felt she was too, uh, you know, wasn't quite well enough to go and have a redo stenotomy. Um, so they took her to the cath lab. Um, as I say, she was on ECMO. They did, that was the report of that, they did a transeptal puncture. You can see that happening here. So that's the transeptal puncture going down. Um, and they actually did a TAVI a tavy through this um, bioprosthetic mitral valve to open it up and sort of crack the, the panis. Um, that's how it will have looked. That's actually not hers. That's someone else having a similar thing, um, which improved the flow through that and her gradients and everything improved. But what what complication or what can you see that perhaps wasn't picked up on the on the TTE actually? What else is going on with this? So the valve's opening better, it's no longer pathologically obstructed. He's also got a, a, um, a synic aortic valve in place as well. But what else do you see? Yeah. Yeah, you see it? Can you see that, Rishi? Rob? Yeah. Yeah, this here. She's got paravalvular yeah. regurgitation as well which they actually left during this procedure. So she was brought back to our ICU on BA ECMO um, and then was actually, um, there was a, a deliberate deci decision to leave this paravalvular leak. It was felt to be mild to moderate. Um, and if it wasn't causing any trouble with hemolysis, they're actually just gonna leave it. And she was weaned off ECMO, she went to the ward, but she was having ongoing met calls, you know, related to that MR um, congestion and all of that. So they actually took her back and did another, um, a procedure in the cath lab where they actually plugged plugged the hole and she went home wow. yeah she also grew um i think she was staph aureus positive as well so yeah really really complex case and i it's um anyway and this is obviously uh, as a result of the transeptal puncture um she has this uh, left to right left to right shunt across the transeptal puncture so some cases um and I have kept you running over by half an hour again. Sorry for that, but um, no hope you hope you learned a few things. And um, yeah, any burning questions? You probably all wanted to run away. That was very good, uh, Emma. It's Andrew here. Oh, hi, Andrew. So you were able to do VA ECMO at Nepean? No, this is when I was at a different hospital, Andrew. Oh, OK, right. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was impressed. Yeah. OK, very good. I just wanted to ask you a quick question. Do you integrate um, an APN uh, CT and cardiac MRI uh, with this to um, as a combined to do some kind of hybrid assessment? Yeah, it's a great question, Rishi. Um, and certainly there's a move towards more multimodal assessment, you know, for valve problems. We obviously have a pretty good cardiac MRI service um, and we have dedicated cardiology imaging, you know, um, imaging consultants with a special interest in that. So I think a lot of that we actually don't see so much, but I know that the cardio, and we, but we go to all their joint meetings or a lot of their joint meetings, you know, and you could, they, they obviously refer to, to Faraz, our cardiologist for, for things like that. There have been times we've, you know, I can think of one in the ICU maybe a few months back where we where we did absolutely combine CT and fluoroscopy um, in a patient where we were worried about their valve. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely depending on the patient. Um, and we have the we have this sort of setup and, and skill set for that. And you you'll 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 be involved in those meetings and stuff when you join us. Yeah. yeah the learning opportunities are there absolutely if you wanted to go and join for us in cardiac MRI and um, CT and he's a wealth of knowledge isn't he Michael and all this stuff. You tap into it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. All that right. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.